Can we talk about why Apple is calling this spatial computing instead of AR or VR? When I went to this school, um, this was the building that I spent uh, a lot of my time in. That's the CS building at UW. And, uh, you know, one of the best, um, one of the best classes that I took here was this one on human computer interaction. It was one of the most foundational classes that sort of changed the way that I think. Um, a lot of my other CS classes were about the fundamentals of the actual kind of nitty gritty side of computing, but human computer interaction was all about the design of a computer and the way that it affects how we use it. And <laughs> as someone who's spent a lot of his life going between the more creative side of my personality and the more technical side of my personality, it felt like a really natural fit for me at the time. One that I didn't expect, actually, initially. Um, <laughs> and, the reason I, I, and the reason I bring it up is because I think that the big question with the Vision Pro is whether spatial computing, as Apple puts it, is truly as paradigm shifting as some of the other innovations that they brought to the world in the past. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have called the Vision Pro AR goggles or a VR headset. Um, people before it was announced thought it would be called, um, you know, XROS because it was like both uh, augmented reality and also a virtual reality headset. So XR was like between the two, it was a cross between the two realities. Um, but Apple, <laughs> being Apple, came up with their own term, right? Um, and honestly, if there's anybody out there that has the right to do it, it's probably them just from a historical perspective. And that's sort of what I wanted to get into today, which was the history of those paradigm shifts in personal computing and the way in which the Vision Pro represents Apple's beliefs in the future of what that might hold. So at the beginning of Apple, you know, uh, it was just two guys, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, throwing together computers and sharing them with their buddies in a little uh, group that you know, shared computers, homemade computers with one another. And um, Steve Wozniak was just an extremely talented man uh, and built a good enough computer that everybody kind of drooled over it. He had this knack for doing, squeezing every little bit out of the device that he could get for, it, for the amount that he put in. Um, after selling a few of those, they bootstrapped Apple uh, with the money they made and a few dollars, uh, I think that was sold from like a van or something like that, that Steve had or whatever. And then eventually they ended up taking that money and creating the Apple II. And the Apple II is what a lot of people consider the very first personal computer. It's the thing, as Apple puts it, that ignited the personal computing industry. This was a big deal at the time, right? Because computers uh, then were those big images that you see in like the NASA laboratories with rooms full of vacuum tubes, tape. They were these shared devices, it was a communal thing. They were the priests of the computers that you'd go and hand them your code to run the computations on and then get that, that information back, right? But eventually what happened uh, <laughs> was that people started putting, cobbling together these smaller devices that could be used as these sort of smart endpoints to those, to those computers. And eventually, those smart endpoints became powerful enough that they could do some functionality on their own. And that was what the Apple II was. 
It was uh, a command line if you've ever accidentally opened up the terminal or if you're a nerd like me and uh, use the terminal <laughs> for the, your profession or for the things that you create. Um, that was the entirety of the interface to the computer at the time. Um, but the thing that made the Apple II successful beyond the fact that it was a great device with sort of that, a great piece of hardware and engineering was not the device itself. The device sold itself and people liked it because it was a good enough device. The thing that sold it was an app, the first real spreadsheet app. From what I remember, it was a couple guys that saw one of their professors, I think an economics professor, tabulating things and having to erase things on the chalkboard in front of the classroom. And how long and tedious it was to change something in one of the columns and change another cell and then change another cell as that it cascaded down. And they thought, computers are really fast at doing calculations. And uh, we've got this really great personal computer that we have now, this Apple II. I really want to just throw together something that will uh, solve that problem, that would solve that problem that the economics professor had. And so they threw together VisiCalc was the name of it. And that became the foundation of what sold Apple computers. They didn't buy Apple computers, Apple IIs, because it was a great computer. They bought it because there was something that somebody wanted to do with it. So who was buying? Well, it was small businesses. The personal computer reduced the, it was cheap enough that these small businesses think, you know, the teriyaki shop down the street or the laundromat or your local vintage store, that they wanted to run calculations and do inventory. And they wanted to balance their books and everything like that. It just so happened that the spreadsheet was the perfect tool for that. It totally changed everything. And so people found out that they said, oh, there's this thing. It's not just this hunk of box that can run some code. It has this application on it that can fundamentally change the way that I do something in the world. And that really inspired something, I think, in Steve Jobs and in Apple that is still with them to this day, that it's all about the application, the end application, the user experience, the human computer interaction that maybe is not as present in other companies, that it's all about the end point and that you kind of work backwards from there to the technology. So let's fast forward to the Mac, the thing that, you know, I want to say 80, 90% of the college kids on this campus use every single day, the thing that I used all through college. The Mac, 1984, introduced at the Super Bowl, huge, splashy ad. But the Mac was known for its graphical user interface. It took the command line, the terminal thing that was on the Apple II, and it was a computer that was, as the marketing copy put it, for the rest of us. It was designed to be sold in the millions. The first, I think the first computer ever that was sort of designed to be sold in the millions uh, because they thought they had made it just easy enough for the average person to use. And it turns out that they were kind of right. I mean, we still, the graphical user interface, the thing that we use to click and drag and drop, the thing that we use with the mouse and not just the keyboard, that obviously caught on and it's still, I mean, the Mac is a, a great success to this day. It would be a Fortune 500 company on its own. But at the time, it was less guaranteed. And a big reason for that, and actually it was the reason that to, take a step back, it was the reason that Steve Jobs was kicked out of Apple originally, because it kind of tanked at the beginning. And so the question was, why did it really tank? I mean, Apple, they created great applications for it. It was easy to use for most people. It did have a really loyal base, and eventually it did find a market in uh, desktop publishing, uh, replacing all the literal cutting and pasting that you would do with, uh, with uh, to put together a newspaper or to put together a magazine, for example, or to a poster or something like that. But that didn't come for a while, and that was because the applications weren't there. And this was the kind of the ultimate failure of the Mac originally, which was that it re required programmers to learn an entire new way of programming on a device that was selling, but wasn't really selling enough to be compelling. I mean, the Apple II really sustained Apple uh, through the original, uh, and the Apple III then at that point, that the kind of core of the Apple II sustained them through the early Macintosh period. 
And that was because the application was there. The spreadsheets were there. Now, the rest of the story, you know, Steve Jobs leaves the company. He starts his own, uh, his, uh, his new computer company called Next. Apple buys Next. They get the software. Next software replaces the original Macintosh operating system. It goes on from there. And of course, we end up with the Mac on, uh, to this day and the Apple that is Apple today. Um, but of course, there were the third thing that happened, the third sort of paradigm shifting uh, revolution uh, in Apple history, which was mobile computing, taking the cell phone and turning it into a computing platform. That one is harder to pinpoint. I mean, there's a lot of things about it that took the spirit of the Apple II and the Macintosh and combined it to be the thing that is probably the greatest consumer product of all time. What they learned from the Lisa, or sorry, not from the Lisa, what they learned from the Apple II was that they needed applications. And actually, they didn't even learn that right away because before at the beginning, the iPhone launched with no app store. We'll get to that in a second. But the thing that they learned from the Mac is that it needed to be easy to use, it needed to be beautiful, it needed to be something that could be a computer for the rest of us. And actually, of course, the graphical user interface was a huge part of that. Even stripping away further uh, the abstraction between you and the computer, taking away the mouse and literally using your finger to control the device. And they knew that that was revolutionary at the time. They touted it. There was also just the appetite at the time. It was just a better phone than the rest of the phones. And so that gave Apple an advantage. So people were ravenous for the device. I mean, it was slow burn still. The iPhone was not an immediate hit, but it, it kind of was, it kind of was. People wanted it, it was sexy. And it, it grew quickly. And it grew so quickly that they took that lesson from the Apple II and created the App Store and allowed developers to extend, the developers were chomping at the bit to extend this new computing platform. And Apple finally caved and let them do that. A lot of that was bootstrapped by these indie developers that had been working on Mac applications for a long time and knew the kind of core of the technology that was powering the iPhone and could then just quickly turn around and use those skills from the Mac and use them on the iPhone. Sorry, my phone died there. You're plugged in, you're all plugged in now, so you have to listen to the rest of my rant. Um, that's all to say that that is what made the iPhone great. The developers creating something for the platform that people really wanted to use. Yes, the phone needed to be hot. Yes, it needed to be better than what was out there. Yes, it probably needed the graphical user interface to make it accessible to people. But smart developers going out there, literally bootstrapping the literally creating it, the possibility for the campaign, for Apple to make the, cam the, the ad campaign, there's an app for that. That wouldn't have happened without people developing for the platform. That's all to say that Apple is here and they want us to talk about this spatial computing. They did it with personal computing. They did it with the graphical user interface. They did it with mobile computing. And now they want us to talk about spatial computing and their track record is pretty good in terms of figuring out what the next paradigm is and writing it. And so why do they call it that? Why don't they call it AR or VR? Why don't they call it MR or XR? And I think it's because spatial computing is something that is familiar. It also puts a stake in the ground for what it is and what it isn't. Um, if you listen to the Verge cast, Neil Lai is a huge you know, he loves to harp on the idea that uh, <laughs> these, these are goggles, they're VR goggles. They're not AR, they're not really augmenting reality. But in a certain sense, they kind of are. He says that they're sort of a, um, an emulator for augmented reality. And I think that that's the perfect way to put it. It is literally the vision that Apple has for this type of computing, spatial computing, which is that you're gonna have these apps, they're trying to take the lessons from the, phone, from the iPhone and therefore from the, the uh, Mac and from the Apple II and apply them to their next device. And so when Apple talks about spatial computing, they are talking about using apps on an infinite canvas in the real world. And I think that that is the fundamental shift, that you're no longer confined to, and I forget who said this, but essentially a window 
into Alice's Wonderland, which is what a computer has always been, but that your entire world becomes a computing service. Uh, and it just so happens right now that Apple believes that this will primarily be, and if you look at their demos and the, the way that they market this device, that a lot of that will just be the stuff that's out in front of you. You're literally your app floating in front of you. So Ben, you talked a lot about the metaverse the other day and AR, VR, but I think that the foundational fundamental shift is a little more humble than that. It's just that you have a lot of space to do the things that computers are good at doing out in the real world. And the question is, will the developers show up? Can they show up? Has Apple done a good enough job? Has they, have they made it tempting enough to make for this platform uh, that they're going to end up with an app for that? A good example of uh, application-based design <laughs> is the humble bench. Benches, chairs, they're not around because they're high tech. They don't stick around because somebody really innovated. Designers love to create them, but the bench is, is there because it fulfills a need. The same way that an application fills a need. The same way that BusyCalc filled a need for somebody out there. Uh, I think this is true of all design. That if you think, if you begin with the end in mind, you're going to have a much better chance of being successful. But, uh, yeah, that bench over there. That one over there. They're here because somebody wanted to use it. 